Okay, folks, uh, thank you all for joining us to the next BPPB, I can never pronounce the whole thing, uh, in one flow uh, seminar. Uh, uh, we are very happy to have Gautam Menon, uh, who, uh, despite the time zone he is in, in India, uh, has been kind enough to uh, agree to speak. Uh, he's going to talk about activity, phase separation, and nuclear architecture. And for those of you who don't know Gautam, he's at the Ashoka University and the Institute of Mathematical Sciences in India. Uh, so Gautam, uh, please uh, take it away. Thank you, Ashok, and, and thank you to the BPPB organization for inviting me to speak here. I want to tell you about work that we've been doing for about the last roughly 10 years on a particular problem. And that has to do with nuclear architecture. So I want to explain, since I said this would be part general introduction, background, and then later the meat of the talk, I'll spend some time on general philosophy of what it is we are doing, what it is, what the different components are that we need to put together in order to be able to do this calculation. So let me get to my first slide. And this is not a biophysics slide. This is a fit of the black body curve to black body radiation. And you have data points there, and you have a line that fits it. The line comes from the formula that's below. And of course, as all of you know, this is an extremely good fit to data that is, in a sense, very remarkable. It comes to us from the earliest parts of the universe. There are things that are fairly amazing about this. First of all, the size of each of those data points is about one five hundredth the actual, I mean, it, it's 500 times more than the actual error on the data itself. So you wouldn't be able to see the points if they were plotted exactly. They would be too small to see if they were plotted exactly representative of the accuracy of that. And you can see that the fit does very well. So this is an example of physics theory doing very well on a physics problem. We can go now to the role of biophysical theory. And given the previous slide, you could ask, can you bring to biological modeling the same sort of rigor and precision that you had in the models in physics that came from the earlier slide. And that's typical biological data that you see in, in, in the image there. And I've carefully disguised the, the, the X and the Y axis because it's actually irrelevant to the point that I want to make, which is that this data is very noisy and biological systems are intrinsically noisy. And that's something that one has to keep in mind. You will have no situation in which you can measure anything to the accuracy of the same size or much smaller than the size of the symbol that you use to actually plot the data, as you saw in the previous case. What else do we need to know when we think about biology and biophysics and biophysical problems? So here's a list of some things. First of all, cells are very genetically soft matter. And by soft matter, we have the whole language of polymers, membranes, colloids, surfactants, et cetera. But this is soft matter subject to some very specific constraints when we talk about biology, especially about the biology of living cells. These are highly constrained soft matter systems. They're small, they're confined, they're very crowded. Nevertheless, the same language of deformable, flexible, polydispersed composites, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We can use that in the same context that we think about soft matter, except that we have to worry about these special constraints that apply to pretty much anything that's actually living if we want to study it. The second, in a sense, most important point, apart from the context that I described earlier, is that living cells are not in thermal equilibrium. They have energy that constantly passes through them. In addition, they process information. There's a fairly complex encoding of different types of information. You can encode information in sequence. You can encode information in structure. You can encode information in positioning as well. You can also encode information in other types of even more subtle ways of recording what the sudden state of the cell and changes in the state of the cell. And statistical descriptions of such complexity are what lie at the core of our ability to think about cells out of equilibrium, subject to the sort of constraints of soft matter that I described earlier. By not in equilibrium, I mean something like the, the GIF image that you see there. This is a molecular motor or the lower part of a molecular motor moving forward. It moves through operating through the by taking in an ATP molecule, hydrolyzing that to ADP and releasing an organic phosphate. And this converts through a mechanochemical process into the stepping forward of the motor one step at a time. So that's an, an, if you keep the ratio of ATP and ADP out of equilibrium, this is a way of feeding the system with energy. And that's the way you pass energy constantly through living systems. So now the question is, you have a problem that's stated is this is, you can think of cells generically as soft matter, processing information out of equilibrium, confined in various ways, et cetera. What would you consider to be progress in 
the quantitative modeling and the understanding of specific systems in biology. And I want to talk about one specific system that I've been studying for some years. But even before we get to that, one should ask, what are the sort of questions you should be asking in the first place? And even as important as that, the question of what level of answer would actually satisfy you? What is, A, what are the questions? And B, what sort of answers would you accept as being, in a sense, representative of an understanding, a broad understanding of what's actually going on with that living system? It's important to think about these because given any system, there are a whole bunch of questions that you can ask. Most of these questions would be unanswerable, in a sense, within specific modeling context. So one must match both the model to the question that you're trying to ask, and you must understand very clearly what are the sort of answers that you wish to get out of that description. So when one thinks about models, essentially what one does is to leave out detail. You want to capture essential features of the ultimate goal, but what details? And ideally what you want to do is to capture essential features and have what you can't capture essentially as noise about that smooth description that you want to actually extract. Of course, the problem, as all of you know, especially the experts will know, is that there's no well-defined, acceptable, generally acceptable way of doing that in a completely general context, whatever people may tell you. And at best, you may have intuition from similar studies. You know that physics works. Physics is the right description of pretty much anything, all the way from the very small to the very large. And so the, the application of physics to the sorts of questions, to the nature of modeling that you want to describe, which assumes a certain length scale that you want to model at, that's going to be the question that we're, going to, that we're going to confront. I'm going to talk about metazoan cells. Metazoans are multicellular eukaryotic organisms, cells that belong to multicellular eukaryotic organisms that form the animal kingdom. So we're leaving plants out of here, and there are some examples there of cells that you can take that are metazoan cells. And we want to look at particular phenomena that happen in the cells of metazoans. That's the picture of a single cell. That's you have the cell membrane, the plasma membrane outside. You have lots of membrane-enclosed organelles, because these are all eukaryotic cells. And you have the object that's marked there in the dotted line, which is the cell nucleus. And there's obviously a lot of structural complexity here, but I want to zoom in on the nucleus and describe what our work is connected to what's inside the nucleus and how one begins to model certain questions that one can ask at this point. Here's a quick reminder, as this is supposed to be the tutorial part, so I'll assume that at least some of you don't remember all of this in the sort of basic biology stuff. One has, inside the nucleus, one has genes on chromosomes. These genes are transcribed into messenger RNAs, messenger RNA then leaves, and then is translated into proteins outside the nucleus. The process of, of DNA to mRNA to protein, et cetera, this is the fundamental dogma regarding the flow of information from DNA and initially as a storage of information to the final product, which is the proteins. And of course, there's a lot of complication here. There's just that I will not even refer to. I just want you to remember these terms that there's a process of transcription that involves stuff that is fundamentally inside the nucleus, which is what we'll be concerned with at this point. There are 23 pairs of chromosomes inside the nucleus of most cells, apart from the sex cells. Each chromosome is a single long DNA molecule. So there's one chromosome one, two, three, roughly ordered by size. There's the X chromosome and the Y chromosome. Women have two X chromosomes. Men have an X and a Y. You can, the, the size dependence here, the 20, by the time you get to 21 and 22, these are very small chromosomes over here. And they're all very tightly localized inside the nucleus. So the nucleus confines what really is a polymeric structure and you have these 23 into two long DNA molecules together with a lot of other soupy stuff inside the nucleus. If you added, again, this is a common example that is used if you took all of the DNA inside a single cell and put laid it end to end, that's a length of about two meters just there. If you multiply this by the, by the 10 trillion cells odd that you have inside an adult human body, that adds up to something to a total length that would go about 80 times between the sun and the earth and, and back. So there's a lot of long coiled up molecule inside our cells. And this is just one example. And we'll be interested in that molecule and what it does. The useful term here is it, 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 when we think about, for example, DNA mechanics, we usually think about bare DNA. It's the DNA molecule itself in some stable solution. But DNA inside the nucleus in a living cell is complex with various sorts of accessory proteins. There's all sorts of machinery that works on it. The useful word here is chromatin. Chromatin is DNA plus accessory proteins, plus RNA, plus basically any stuff that binds to DNA within the nucleus. So now we have abstracted our physics problem to saying that we should now consider the polymer physics of chromosomes inside the nucleus, if that's what we're interested in. And that's what we will be interested in in this talk. 
to understand what is it that chromatin is doing inside the nucleus. So we've now sort of started with a very large picture of what modeling ought to be doing, saying that we're interested in soft matter, we're interested in the constrained soft matter that turns up in biological context. We have to add to that the fact that biological material, living biological material is out of equilibrium. And we've zoomed in now on the nucleus and said that if we want to understand this particular sub-problem out of all the com complex problems that have to do with, with uh, understanding the biophysics of living things, we can think about the polymer physics of chromosomes inside the nucleus. So now the questions are, what does one do with this? What do the experimental data say? And what are the questions that it confronts us with? So here's a question that I want to think about. The question is, what determines large-scale nuclear architecture in metazoan cells, that particular type of cells, animal cells that I told you about, which are eukaryotic cells, the same cells that make up my body or yours. And we have to account for all of the complexity that I told you about in the beginning. This is soft matter. It's a problem in soft matter, a problem in, in polymer physics of soft matter. But noise is important. It's small. The system is. It's confined. It's crowded. And it's not in equilibrium. So any description that we need of, the, of chromatin must account for all of these different constraints. I want to describe a model to you that takes these constraints seriously and confronts a particular way of modeling the system with experimental data. So here is an old picture. So this is what you might have got from a textbook dating to the 90s and before, which would have said the nucleus is filled with intermingling chromatin fibers, basically the polymer, and loops like a dish of spaghetti. And that's a dish of spaghetti that was used to headline the, the talk announcement that Ashok sent around. And this is, in, at, on the face of it, it's the perfectly reasonable approximation. You have lots of polymers. They're all mixed up right together. And you know what other sort of visual picture might you have other than spaghetti or noodles of some, some kind? So that's a starting point that was, in fact, the starting point for many of these studies prior to around the 90s, which is not too long, which two years ago, but there's been about a century and a half of studies of chromatin before that. We now know that this picture has to be corrected in various ways. What we know now is that chromosomes are territorial. They occupy specified regions where they don't overlap too much in the bulk. If they do overlap, it's really towards the boundaries of, of, of each individual chromosome. But what's even more important is that the placements of these chromosomes are not random. We're going to talk about, for specificity, I'm going to talk about human cells, which are the most complicated cells I could think about. I'm going to talk about human cells in interface, that's between divisions which an interface typically occupies about 80% of the time that the cell like, takes between, between divisions. So that's a fair amount of time that we're actually talking about. And we want to understand, first of all, this is one question that confronts us. Here is the nucleus here. You can see the, the cartoon image that shows you different chromosomes, could be one, two, three, four, et cetera. But the first point to note is that these chromosomes are not spaghetti. They're not the picture that was there in the previous picture. They seem to have fairly well-defined locations within this. And there may be some biophysical logic to what these positions are, because we're going to talk finally about very large molecules, about polymers. And finally, the question of how does one move a big polymer from one point to the other must involve physics at a very core. It's not a, it's not a microscopic, small-scale biological problem, but it does have physics at its core. Okay, so this is probably a good point to stop. It's a little early, but I've, been, I've, I've said all my general statements so far. I want to get a little bit into, into more technical discussions of what it is at the calculation. I could go on a little further and then take a break, or I could you know, ask, one, you know, ask people if they have questions about the generalities that I've spoken about so far. Maybe, maybe go on a little further. Uh, so uh, you you tell me, Ashok, when I should. Yeah, when yeah, I should yeah, yeah. So let's now look at the nucleus itself. So this is just zooming in on the nucleus. This is an electron microscopy image that shows you very clearly two colors. One is a dark color, one is a lighter color. The dark color tends to be more peripheral. And that's called heterochromatin. The light color that sort of seems to be a little more central apart from this little whisker of heterochromatin that sits inside, that's called euchromatin. Heterochromatin is poor in genes. Remember that the whole sequence of DNA contains genes along it. About 2% of the human genome code codes for proteins, which are the, the, the gene parts in between. And about 8% altogether has various types of complicated regulatory functions that are relevant to, to having the 2% of protein coding regions actually written out. And there's a large part of the genome that's basically inherited across history from various sources and whose you know, ultimate provenance is somewhat unclear what it actually does. And so been a controversy about is it actually useful? Is it not useful? Is some part of it useful? Is it not useful? But now I think we've, we sort of converged, roughly speaking, to the idea that there's a limited amount that's actually useful to the cell and the rest of it is basically just inherited from our past. 
So heterochromatin, so I use the word chromatin. I will now specialize that into heterochromatin, euchromatin. Heterochromatin is gene poor, but most importantly for our purposes, it tends to be outside. It's more peripheral to the nucleus. Euchromatin is gene rich, it's highly transcribed, and it tends to be more central to the nucleus. And we'll come back to this particular point a little later. And here's my point about where is, why is this non-equilibrium? And the answer is that it's non-equilibrium for the same reason that, the, that our pet subjects of non-equilibrium, so the molecular motor that you can see here, are out of equilibrium. There are many processes that happen inside chromatin, on chromatin, on the DNA, that involve ATP becoming ADP through hydrolysis, and that releasing energy that powers some specific process. I will list some of those as we go along, but for the time being, here is where it's the same source. It's still ATP being hydrolyzed that leads to this. The important word here is activity, and this is the word that I will use from now on. Activity is, is really the microscopic you know, transduction of energy into forces at the scale of a few nanometers. It's not the large scale injection of forces from the outside that we're familiar with in other physics contexts. And activity is believed to be the core of how biological, the modeling of biological systems differs, of living biological systems differs from the modeling of pretty much anything else. So the whole idea, activity sort of derives from a whole sequence of ideas that are about maybe 20, 25, 30 years old at this point that have to do with self-propelled objects, things, birds, flock, flocking, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And ways of thinking about that that abstract the most basic idea of them all, which is that you must have some source of pumping energy that is local to the basic unit that you're actually considering. And this will come back as a recurrent theme as I go along. So now we're thinking of chromatin as active soft matter. That's going to be our basic philosophy. And now we want to go forward and see, all right, is this way of thinking about it any use at all? So here are the what I will call large-scale nuclear architecture. This talk is about large-scale nuclear architecture and the effects of, 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 um, of, of how the, the physics that I've described to you so far, the physics of confinement, the physics of being out of equilibrium, the physics of being soft and polymeric, how does that affect questions that we can ask about nuclear architecture? So I want to list four main things that we would like to explain. First of all, chromosomes are territorial in character. Why is that? Not spaghetti. The second is why is euchromatin central and heterochromatin peripheral to the nucleus? That's a very basic, that, in fact, that observation, because it goes back to the days of electron microscopy and before you could do much more local measurements on chromatin. That's an old, it's at least about 40, 40, 50 years old. You can say that why is this the case in nuclear in general? Why is it that individual chromosomes, so the previous statement, statement number two was about chromatin in general and the subtle internal distinction between heterochromatin and euchromatin. But you can ask a question about specific chromosomes as well. Why is it that individual chromosomes are often positioned by gene density with the highly gene dense chromosomes, this is number of genes divided by the total number of, um, number of base pairs is one way of thinking about it, but sometimes also by size. What determines these regularities? And then there are a bunch of other questions, all of which are equally interesting. Why is it that the active and inactive X chromosomes in women, why are they differentially positioned? Because after all, they really have the same sequence. What, did, what determines the positioning of one with respect to the other? Why is it that active alleles that are transcribed as opposed to ones that are, that are not, why do they seem to be closer to the nuclear center? Why are there apparent regularities in the shapes of chromosomes? in the shapes, the projections, various types of measurements that we can now use to study chromosomes at an individual level, where do these come from? So all of these statements here are what I would call stylized facts. This is a term that comes from economics and from other parts of complex systems that you can always find biological systems where one or the other of these statements is not true. You can find systems that are very strongly distributed by size or only by gene density and not by combination of both. You can find even systems in which euchromatin is peripheral and, and heterochromatin is central. There are certain systems that do that. So as in all of biology, there are counterexamples. What we're doing here is to extract a set of facts that seems to be broadly similar across metazoan cells and say that can we find a common explanation for these? And maybe those edge cases, the stuff that, that doesn't quite conform to these have other reasons why they behave in a particular way. That's a philosophy that we will actually take here. So the hypothesis is that the large-scale architecture of the metazoan nucleus, the same question that I asked in the previous slide, can be understood completely as, as a combination of activity, confinement, looping, and phase separation. Looping, there's a question mark, because even the question of looping may not be that important, finally. But these four ingredients I want to suggest as a hypothesis are enough to explain large-scale features of how chromatin is organized in human cells. 
Okay, so that's a sort of strong statement. It suggests that my modeling must include each of these four. It suggests that I must confront the results of my modeling with the specific experimental data. And the theory lives or dies based on how well it does and how the sort of questions that it can answer, questions that have not been asked, as well as questions that have been asked. And the better the theory is, the better it will be able to answer a whole range of questions. The questions in the previous slide had all the way to do with chromatin in bulk. It had to do with euchromatin and heterochromatin. It had to do with questions of individual chromosomes. It had to do with even sort of questions even within that, between the inactive and the ex active X chromosomes, about individual alleles on chromosomes, et cetera, as well as large scale regularity. So in principle, what I would like to do is to suggest that these four points should be able to explain all of those regularities together and not just one or the other, which you might have started out doing. So here's the challenge. Imagine that I give you a whole bunch of nuclei, the same cell type that I have here. In that, I locate the positions of, let's say, chromosome 21 in all of these. There are two copies that you can see. I find out what the center of mass is of each of these, and I can reference it graphically in the scatter plot that you see on the bottom left. Or I can show it in a statistical representation, which I will show you later, where I look at an observed frequency as a function of the radial distance from the center of the nucleus drawn. Okay, so the, given any regularity in that distribution, I should be able to see it in the statistical representation that you see in the picture on, on, on the lower right, and there should be an explanation for this. So the challenge would be predict this. Do the experiment or look at the results of experiments that people have done in the past, extract from that statistical representations of the sort that I will show you below, and then use the theory to predict what they ought to be. Okay. So the physical context is to the left. There's energy input, this is out of equilibrium. Activity is the important word here. And the hypothesis is, apart from the sort of four very general points that I made about chromatin organization, is that it's activity, which is inhomogeneous across gene-rich and gene-poor region, which determines at a fundamental level, you can add in confinement, you can add in all of these other things. They're all very important parts of the description. But to really be predictive, what you need to do is to account for activity, which is not the same across gene-rich and gene-poor regions. And that determines large-scale nuclear architecture. Okay, so remember, that's my hypothesis. That's what I'm going to start with. Now the question is, how do I implement all of these ideas? So a brief interlude about the fact that chromatin is a very, in quotes, active place to be inside the nucleus. There's lots of energy-consuming processes that, have, that act on chromatin that exert forces. Typically, one, 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 takes, one takes ATP, hydrolyzes it, and uses that energy to exert some force on whatever substrate it is that you're attached to. So transcription is an active process. It consumes energy. Chromatin remodeling, you have to open up chromatin from the stuff that's bound to it so that the transcription machinery can move along. So you want to keep regions of euchromatin always sort of cleaned up in preparation for the fact that there are genes, there are large numbers of genes which need to be written out. DNA repair, transcription is all said and done a noisy process. So there's a lot of repair machinery inside the nucleus which comes in and then has to operate and set things right. And that's also energy consuming. The enzymes that I show you, the switch sniff, the RSC complex, et cetera, et cetera, all of these are stuff that bind and unbind to the nucleus. These reorder chromatin, these are chromatin remodeling enzymes. All of them are energy, or large numbers of them are energy consuming. So now we need to say that, look, we know that this is an active object. How does one model activity on chromatin, keeping in mind the ideas that I told you about earlier? So this is how we're going to do it. I'm going to break up the genome into one MB segment, one megabase, 10 to the six bases together. And I'm going to call these my monomers. Okay. Why do I choose one megabase? I could have chosen you know, 500 KB. I could have chosen a smaller amount. But roughly speaking, the understanding from many years of biological work is that this one MB segment is a good building block for chromosome territories. It doesn't make sense to look at it too small because then you can't tell territories apart from each other. But the one MB scale is roughly speaking a tractable scale to think about large scale properties of individual chromosomes as well as nuclear architecture. Again, to sort of go back to the point that I made earlier, it's very important to decide what scale you're modeling, because that scale will tell you about what questions you can answer. This method cannot answer anything about which particular gene is being transcribed at high levels or low levels. That's an input to the theory. And the processes that transcription, the mechanical, the chemomechanical processes that transcription is, of course, a much more microscopic base pair level question. We can't answer any of that. What we can answer, we can hope to answer, is questions that are more natural to physicists, which is at the large scale, what is the nature of the structure that is built in if you have all of these basic ingredients that I told you about, of which activity is the most important. 
So let's imagine that we take a chromosome, take chromosome number one or two. That's that's the sort of picture that I've shown you there. I know break it up into one MB units. Because I know the human genome, I know which genes there are along this. I know that that, that particular blue blue uh, monomer that I showed you here may have 50 genes. The yellow monomer that I showed you there may have 200 genes. I know how they're ordered along this because I know the genome. And given this, I know there are different gene densities. And I will treat these as my building blocks. And then I will make the important biophysical assumption that the activity of the monomer is set by how much the transcription level is of the genes that it contains. Okay, that's my general statement. If it has lots of genes that are being transcribed, that will be more, in quotes, active. If it has no genes at all, it will be inactive. If it has a small number of genes, its activity will be correspondingly lowered. So once I do that, so now I have to ask, how do I implement activity? So now I'm going to make a sort of certain set of physical assumptions. I'm going to say activity at the microscopic level is really at the 10 to 20 base pairs. But I'm looking at the one megabase, one, one, one megabase pair scale. So there are going to be lots and lots of these events that are really uncorrelated with each other if you move about 200, 300 base pairs away. And they're all going to add up in general to the activity associated with that one megabase pair. So there's some sort of generic hand-waving central limit theorem that should apply here that says, I add up all of these stochastic pushing events, these mechanical events that are adding up there, they're roughly distributed in a Gaussian manner. And I can figure out what the width of that is and what the height of that is. But these are events that exert forces. So then I say that this should be, roughly speaking, equivalent to a temperature in the sense that by central argument, central limit arguments, it's given by Gaussian, it's uncorrelated from point to point across monomers. So I'm going to think of this as each monomer having a certain associated effective temperature that depends upon the number of genes that it actually contains. So this is equivalent to, in quotes, a temperature, but it's not the same across monomers. It's a fingerprint of the nature of the genome across each of these chromosomes there. And I can now assign my temperatures based on physical intuition for what might be going on and how I connect activity, magnitudes of gene transcription to levels of activity to my effective temperature. So the more active it is, larger fluctuate, mechanical fluctuations, so that finally activity leads to mechanical fluctuations. But in the central limit sense, I can think of these uncorrelated mechanical fluctuations at the scale of 1 MB as given by an effective temperature with some shifted temperature value away from thermodynamic temperatures. So here's the simplest model that I could think about. And that's uh, just compute the gene density across each one MB segment on each chromosome. Just choose arbitrarily 5% of monomers by gene density, the top five by gene density, and let them see a larger effective temperature. And let that temperature be you know, 12. 20 is useful because you know that a single ATP hydrolysis event releases an energy which is comparable to about 18 to 20 times room temperature, 10 times the logical temperature, roughly speaking. That's one number to take. And you can see what happens if instead of 20, I choose three or five or 10 or something. All I know is that these numbers ought to be different from each other. T equal to one is, is physiological temperature. T equal to 25, 10 is the increment of that temperature through active mechanical processes that act on these individual monomers that I have. Now notice that each chromosome contains a unique pattern, or I can call it a fingerprint of active and passive monomers because it encodes the genes that are contained in each of these monomers. So chromosome 18 and 19, which you will see below, these have roughly the same gene, the same length, but different gene densities. 18 is gene poor. So it has only, so that line that is shown there has my cutoff. There's only one monomer that sticks above that cutoff. Chromosome 19 is gene rich. It has lots of housekeeping genes. So the whole bunch, you can see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight monomers that actually stick out about that background, about that background. So you can see that the fingerprint now, I am able to assign a certain meaning to the difference between chromosome 18, 19, 12, 20, 1, 2. And I have also information about the length of these chromosomes inside this. So now we have enough to do a calculation. We have confinement, we have all of this, and we can simulate all of this together. It's about 6,400 monomers to simulate inside any sort of confined geometry that you choose densities of the monomers, et cetera, to match those of the experimental system. These are self-repelling monomers. We can choose a Feeney bond. There's Gaussian co-potential that applies there. You can change nuclear shapes going all the way from spherical to ellipsoidal. You can choose both, have the confining region completely passive or have it attractive selectively to certain types of monomers. And you can choose the nature of looping. And the simplest model to do is just to choose a random loop model. Say that you will just tie regions of chromosomes together at random with some low probability until you have a certain number of loops inside the system. Okay, those are the equations below. That's a sort of sample of chromosome 18 and 19 in the blue and the red color below. And this may be a good time to stop for questions and I'm happy to do that at this point.
Folks, I don't see any questions in the chat, but if you do have a pressing question, why don't you unmute yourself and jump in? We'll just pause for a minute or two. Yeah, David, go ahead. I got them. I, I was curious about your, your simple model where you choose to make this cutoff of 5% and then you give them a significantly elevated temperature compared to yeah. the rest. And I guess, can you talk at all about what the distribution of gene densities looks like? Is it is it bimodal in a sense, or are you kind of cutting off a smooth continuum of gene it's density? Smooth, How to think about that? Smooth continuum. It's a smooth continuum. There's a fair, I think, 10 to 20% have very low gene density. The rest of it's smoothly distributed, but you have stuff at about, I think, 700, 800. There are a few monomers left that are about 700, 800 uh, genes. There. So it has a long tail. Certainly, the bulk of it is on, on the low density side. I will show you an improved version of this, which doesn't have the simple cutoff, but does a better job of relating gene densities, transcription levels to temperature as we go along. John, do you want to? Hi, yeah. Um, yeah, I was just curious about um, the, 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 the activity that you're assigning to these uh, regions. So if I understand correctly, these are really internally generated from activity uh, uh, in the chromosome. So because because also you have like actin, myosin on the outside, there's all sorts of external forces. I was wondering like if you have something to say about the role of like the external forces from the rest of the living cell versus the internally generated ones. We, we don't do that. In principle, you could by making the boundary of the, the, the nuclear envelope a little more dynamic to represent forces that are exerted by, by, by actin, tubulin outside. We don't do that. We just treat that to be completely fixed. That's a higher order question as far as we are concerned, John. So it's really internal ATP generated from microscopic processes that happen. There's also sort of strange things that happen with nuclear actin inside the nucleus. And we're not very clear what it actually does. It probably has some regulatory role. But we don't worry about that. We just say that, look, each monomer, depending upon its gene density, has a certain level of activity. Okay. The and questions that you asked are, are more difficult questions. Yeah. And, 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 and the activity is really associated with the chromatin itself. I guess, I guess what I'm thinking about is that, you know, if I think of like force dipole, you know, these activities corresponding to like force dipoles, one might yeah. think that they could be a little bit delocalized, uh, but maybe it, on your, maybe on your one megabit scale, it's not. Yeah, I mean, what, whatever you think, the, the basic microscopic unit of force generation is some tiny little motor-like object moving along moving or attaching to the DNA. And that cannot be more than about 10 to 20 base pairs. So it's, it's like, is really localized. So yeah. it's when you bootstrap that up to the 1 MB scale, you have lots and lots of these little things happening, pretty much uncorrelated with each other. Once you move to a scale of beyond about 200 base pairs. So I think that, I think, is probably a reasonable assumption that should that should actually work. You could argue about the fact that, look, the hard cutoff of 20, the assignment of 5%, et cetera. These are questions that are certainly more. We have no way a priori of figuring out what the right assignment is. I'll tell you a little better way as we go along, but this is how we started. Gautam, there's a question in the chat that uh, your mobility zeta is constant for all monomers, right? That's correct. So that's because it, it's technically what is fixed is the combination of the temperature and the zeta. You can teach zeta to be a constant and the ti to represent the, 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 the effective temperature of each monomer to be where the activity actually enters. It needn't be. I mean, if monomers had different sizes, then the drag coefficients would be different. We, for simplicity, we chose that to be the same for all of you rather than get into more complication in terms of modeling. Uh, Michael Rubenstein has a question. What is the relax relaxation time of a long and short chromosome at t is equal to 20 and t is equal to 1? Ah, good question. I don't... Um, we knew this. We know this from sim. What we're going to do is we're going to start from arbitrary configuration. We're going to wait for it to relax and look only at steady state. And in steady state, all of our all of our results are pretty much independent of what we had in the beginning. We're not going to look at any dynamical quantities. We're going to look at static at, at sequences of static step snapshots in steady state to generate the sort of static questions, st the answers to the questions that I posed earlier, which are really questions about statics and not about dynamics. Questions about dynamics would be much more subtle and there'd be questions of, should you put in high dynamics? At what level should you introduce that? We don't do that. So right now we're, we're looking at the st statics of the steady state. Okay, great, yeah. Hmm. So if there are no more other questions, why don't you carry on? Thanks, Gautam. Okay. So we, now, we, we can now simulate individual chromosomes inside a nucleus of all sorts of funny shapes. So this is chromosome 18 and 19 in, in three differently shaped, uh, three-dimensional 
ellipsoidal, spherical, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then we look at the prediction from here. First of all, run this in steady state, generate large numbers of configurations, and ask where are the genes, because you know where the genes are. Lo and behold, almost automatically, you find that the gene poor region tend to be more outside. Chromosomes with fewer genes on them tend to be located on the outside. The chromosomes with more genes on them tend to be located toward the inside. So you just smeared this out and counted the gene density, the number of genes in each spherical shell about the center of the nucleus, you'd find the sort of color plot that you see here, which is very consistent with the picture earlier of having heterochromatin outside and leuchromatin inside. So that, that at least is something that seems to come out automatically without doing anything else. Here's experimental data. And that's data on two sets of chromosomes, 12 and 20 and 18 and 19. And these have been used by people who work in chromatin for a very specific reason. 12 and 20 have comparable gene densities, okay, but different sizes. Chromosome 18 and 19 have comparable sizes, but different gene densities. If chromosomes are ordered by gene density, we'd expect a, a sort of strong difference in chromosome 18 and 19, the way they're distributed. This, forget about what the, de the definition of the distribution function is and what it ought to be, something called S of R. It basically tells you about how chromosomes are distributed across radial shells starting from the center of the nucleus. And if the, the chromosome 12 to 20 picture shed, tells you that these chromosomes are up more to the outside because the peak is shifted towards the outside. The chromosome 18 and 19, that's where the stark difference lies. Chromosome 18 is gene poor. It tends to be pushed more towards the outside. Chromosome 19 is gene rich. It tends to be pushed more towards the inside. So that's data. It's extracted from experiments. And it's fairly representative of the papers that is taken from our over there. It's fairly representative of what data like does, does look like. That's what the theory does. And you can see the chromosome 18 and 19. The theory are the lines through the points that you can actually see. The, the, the open circles and the open squares are the experimental data. And you can see the theory for the chromosomes 18 and 19 does give you very clearly the distinction between the two distribution functions in that case. On the other hand, for, for chromosomes 12 and 20, you can see that pretty much within the errors, they're pretty much the same. You can see that the theory automatically, without really putting this in at all, tells you that chromosomes 18, 19, 12, and 20 are differentially distributed about the nucleus. This is experimental data on chromosome territory. So you can say, do chromosomes form territories in this model? And the answer is that, yes, they do. You can start from multiple initial conditions, color each chromosome a different color. And you can see just very visually, you can also look at this more numerically, that chromosomes tend to occupy distinct regions there which don't overlap. So this follows again very naturally from the model. It's also a robust consequence, irrespective of how you start, you wind up with situations like this. Here's the distributions of the center of mass of chromosomes. So on the x-axis is chromosome size in MB. So all the way from about 50, 40 to 50 MB to about 250. But the largest chromosome is chromosome one at close to 249 megabases. On the y-axis is the distance from the center of the nucleus, which is at zero below. So right at one is the periphery of the nucleus, zero would be the center of the nucleus. And you can see a distribution here that roughly is consistent with an increase with a function of chromosome size. And you can see what happens with, with the theory. And you can see the theory pretty much fits this. Everything is matched to data in terms of the size of the nucleus, the size of, of each of these of, of, of the, each of these chromosomes itself. And you can see that even gets you know, some of this detail kind of interestingly correct. Okay. So all of this looks very good because we, you put a model, you didn't do anything else. You said, put, put a cutoff, it's going to be active. I'm going to choose the activity to represent gene density because I am convinced of the fact that the gene density has something to do with localized activity. And all of these results just fall out of that particular approach. So the simplest model that I described is surprisingly good, but it's not cell type specific. I'm just using the number of genes averaged over one and be the proxy for activity. And I'm being completely dumb about the way chromosomes are actually connected internally by choosing a random loop model. Okay, so the random loop model just essentially gives you a somewhat more compact chromosomes, and then the job of moving them back and forth, positioning them, is then the job of the activity. But I can do better than this. I can do put in more biological input, and the first is to use transcriptome data. What is it that this particular cell type is actually doing, and which are the genes that are actually being written out in a particular cell type, and from there connect activity of those regions directly to the transcriptome. The second is to use information about how chromosomes are internally connected through, measure, through measures called high c And this is a way of essentially ligating different parts of the chromosomes together in an experiment, fixing the cell, and then looking to see which parts approach each other more closely and constructing very large amounts of statistics from this. 
That's another way of putting into the calculation the inner tendency of different chromosomes to connect in a very specific cell type specific way, and as well as add transcriptional information to this calculation. So you can do this. So what's plotted here is essentially the expression levels. Look at the top right corner. The top right is extracted from standard ENCODE collaboration data, averaged over one megabase. Its expression is plotted on the y-axis. On the x-axis is monomers with a certain expression plotted in increasing order. A couple of things to note. First of all, the y-axis is a logarithmic scale. So there's a logarithmic increase in expression as you go from, well, from, from the lower points to the upper points. Okay. The second is that the shapes are all more or less characteristic. There's a sort of sharp increase at the lower end for low expression. It tends to plateau out and then it increases very sharply again towards the upper end. So a priori looking at this, one might be convinced to, if, so the numbers for the GM12878 cell type is below. Roughly about 50% of, of, um, of monomers lie below on the region where it's sharply increasing, but the activity is low, the expression is low. The plateau region accounts for a further 45.2% of the monomers. And then you have the sharp increase at the end, about 6.4 monomers. And this is different. The exact difference is, is, is depending upon the cell type, different monomers contribute. In, in one cell type, one monomer may be expressed very, very strongly. In the other expression level, maybe very low. But the shape of this is fairly generic across cell types. Now, with this, we can be more clever about saying that, look, there seem to be roughly three regions here. The lower part of it, let's say, is physiological temperature. The intermediate part of it, let's say, is going to be some temperature. It's intermediate between physiological and some higher temperatures you might choose. So choose T equal to 6, for example, or 6 times physiological temperature. And then the further increase is somewhere between 7 and 12. So we've gone all the way down from, from 20 to about 12. Put in this variation that is now monomer specific, it is more, certainly more nuanced in the earlier picture. This draws directly from log from experimental data about expression as a function of monomer. And this is a good starting point. Now you can tweak this. You can say instead of 12, what happens if I have six or seven? The answer is it doesn't matter very much. What matters is that there is a differential expression that reflects in the activity that we're actually going to choose. Okay. So once you're given this, there's a whole lot of stuff you can calculate. You can look at the distribution of center of mass. You can look at the distribution of gene density. You can look at the, at the contacts between the, the P of the property that two genomic loci S from each other are in contact. You can look at the shapes of chromosomes itself, the picture to the left. You can look at projection. There is a technique called 2D fish that looks at essentially projections of the shapes of three-dimensional shapes of chromosomes in two dimensions. And you can compare all of this to the predictions of the model. Okay, straight off heterochromatin, euchromatin, that clicks. You can see the dark regions outside in the picture to the top left is the, is the heterochromatin region. You have euchromatin toward the center. Does activity increase as you go from center to the decrease you go from the center to the periphery? That it does. There's an activity gradient. There's the gradient in gene density, which goes back to the euchromatin heterochromatin distinction. All of this falls out just as it did in the earlier calculation. But now you can do even things specific to cell types. You can look at the GM12878 data, and that's experimental data plotted. We didn't have data for the other cell types. So just showing you what the predictions are from the theory, as well as what the experimental data is for one particular cell type. Again, 12 and 20 don't differ too much from each other. 18 and 19 are quite different from each other. You can look at center mass distribution. You can look at gene density distribution. And you see a stronger cell type dependence in the center of mass distribution. But they're not all that different. And that's an interesting point that largely this seems to be controlled by housekeeping genes that more or less are turned on at the same level in all of these different cell types. And the difference between cell types is a subtler difference. There are differences. It's not to say that there are no substantial differences, but they're certainly much smaller than the larger scale differences that really come from the fact that some genes are pretty much turned on all the time across all cell types. You can look at chromosome territory. You can compare them to 2D fish. You can look at ellipticity, surface to volume ratio, and isotropy, et cetera, because you have access to a whole ensemble of configurations. Qualitative statements that you can make is that more active chromosomes are rougher and less spherical in character. And the picture to the right shows ellipticity, that is the deviation from the sphere, as well as the regularity, which is the roughness. And there's experimental data on two different cell types, the GM12878 cell type, the IMR90 cell type. The theory there is for, there are two theories for each of these things. And the experimental data is on something related to the IMR90 cell type. We couldn't find data for IMR90. You can see that the numbers are roughly correct. And the behavior is also interestingly somewhat correct. 
you can see the sort of downturn there and then a further upturn that you can see across different chromosome number. There's no particular order to this at 13, 18, 4, 8, 21, et cetera, that gives you this type of behavior that we've actually shown here. Okay. Let me tell you about something in, that I personally find very interesting, that the female cells have an active and inactive X chromosome. Men have an X cell or Y. If the reason that both X chromosomes are not active at the same time is that then the cell would generate twice the amount of protein that actually needed. So one is switched off to very specific uh, processes that are extremely interesting in their own right. But what's been known for many years is that these two chromosomes, the X, inactive and the active X, are not positioned in the same way that the inactive X tends to be more peripheral, the active X tends to be more interior. And we know now that the active X is more active because it has the same sort of activity that I spoke to you about earlier. But there's been no, actually, absolutely no theoretical understanding of why this particular result might have come. So we can look at this again. And you can see the pictures again for these multiple cell types that you can see the blue and the red. You can see one curve represents the active, the distribution of active chromosome X. And the second is the distribution of the inactive chromosome X. They're asymmetrically distributed, as you can see from there. It's subtle, but it's still there. And over here, the inactive X is located more peripherally than the active X. So there's a lot that goes into the calculation. The looping of the inactive X is somewhat more complicated, it's more compact, et cetera. All of that is put into the calculation, but then it's just run based on the difference in activity. As far as I know, I mean, all of this stuff, I don't think has, has been predicted anywhere, but this is something I'm particularly interested and excited about because there's no explanation for this at all. And apart from the fact that it must come from activity at some fundamental level. I want to switch now in the last five or 10 minutes to talk about nucleolus. I may go a little bit fast about this. This is unpublished work. Remember that inside the nucleus, the largest subnuclear organelle is something called the nucleolus, which you can see over there. The nucleolus is the most prominent nuclear body and assembles the cell's ribosomal RNAs. There's an important function within the nucleus. The, nu the nucleolus is made up of the ends of a certain set of chromosomes called the acrocentric chromosomes. The acrocentric chromosomes contain what are called nucleolar organizing regions at the ends. These come together in a way that first, they come together in the pieces indicated in the bottom right, and these further assemble together into one of the most two nucleoli that you see in cells towards the end of interface. Okay, so only a limited number of chromosomes that are somewhat asymmetric participate in the formation of the nucleolus. And that imposes a certain structure that was not there in the earlier calculation, where we said we don't bother, we're just putting activity in and looking at what they do. But this seems to be something that we should do, because this certainly is a very prominent structure within the nucleus. So let's think about that. The most significant idea that has come in here is the idea that the formation of the nucleolus is somewhat like liquid-liquid phase separation. It can be thought of in the same language. And here, there are many prominent reviews on this. Chris Brangwin's group has certainly contributed a lot to this. And the idea is that this, it forms a multi-layered biomolecular condensate, essentially through the process of liquid-liquid phase up. These are all liquids over here. It's just that one type of liquid consistent with the nucleolus has formed a somewhat li large density inside the nucleus. So now we model this. We model the nucleolus in terms of monomers that we add to the chromosomes that we already have. Each monomer represents rib ribosomal DNA, nucleolar proteins, et cetera, et cetera. They're proportional to the fraction of the DNA present. And we assign these positions based on what we know about the chromosome and where the nucleolar organizing regions are. So now we have activity and we have phase separation because we put in an interaction that favors these coming together. Without that, without that interaction that encourages phase separation, you would not get the structure at all. So once we put that in, we observe an aggregation. So the picture to the left is, a, is individual um, acrocentric chromosomes, the little ends of these in the red monomers. And you can see as time proceeds to the right, these begin to come together. They begin to aggregate. The time scale of aggregation is a function of the activity, both of the activity of the nucleolar region, as well as the activity of the surrounding chromatin. And then you can go back and ask, okay, let me correct my early predictions for what might have happened for different chromosomes. Use the same chromosome distribution function, but now chromosome 18, 19, 20, 12, 13, 13, 14, 15, 21, 22 are the acrocentric chromosomes. So these, we can now, you can see that there are corrections that appear in their positioning, but there are also corrections that appear in the positioning of other chromosomes due to the subtle coming together of some subset of these chromosomes inside. So you can look at the old calculation and the new calculation with the nucleus and without the nucleus, and you look at how well that data fits with radial position. Look at the comparison between the simulation and the, and the experiments in this. You can see that this is much improved through the addition of the nucleolus. Without the nucleolus, chromosome 21 was somewhat displaced from what it ought to be 
in terms of, 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 the, of the experimental position. But now all of this forms on the same, roughly on the same line. So you've actually accomplished something very interesting. By accounting for the nucleus, you've also improved the positioning of your calculation of the positioning of the chromosomes that don't form the nucleus, that don't go into forming the nucleolus. So here's a quick summary of this, that inhomogeneous activity expedites the coalescence of the nucleolus. It's as though the whole thing is at a larger temperature, things are rattling around more together. So the whole process by which these different nucleolar organizing regions find each other is now accelerated through activity. Activity helps in positioning and localization of the nucleus towards the outside, nucleolus towards the outside. It's known that the nucleolus is a more peripheral organelle within the subnuclear organelle as opposed to anything else. The model predictions match better overall. And the angular position of these chromosomes is also organized, et cetera. I won't talk about that, that particular piece of data. So let me go back to summarizing what I been talking about. I showed you activity, I showed you confinement, I showed you looping, I showed you phase separation. And with these, we were able to describe the positions of each of these individual chromosomes at a level of accuracy that no modeling exercise so far has ever managed to do. Biophysically, we chose a certain modeling level, we chose to model at the one and the one only. We know biophysically that each of these are important, that activity is crucial to this particular decision. If you turned off the activity, none of this would happen. You would get no structure at all. So that's why we believe all of these are, in a sense, essential ingredients. Looping may or may not be important. And this is still, you know, there are many experiments that look at the contacts between, between different parts of chromosomes. And therefore, it's sort of believed that this is especially significant. But there's no real reason why. And there's sort of arguments on both sides saying that, look, some of this may just be irrelevant to what the actual cell is doing. Um, this is work with, Nimendu Ganai, a colleague, a dear friend, colleague who passed away about two years ago, Shurin Sen Gupta, Ankit Agarwal, my student, and Tejal Agarwal, my postdoc, over a bunch of papers starting in 2014, etc. The big detailed paper is a biophysical journal in 2020. So that's the one that I can recommend that you actually look at. Um, this is not the only stuff I do, since there's an audience who I, I don't know at all, apart from a couple of friends who I can see there. I work on nuclear architecture is one thing that I work on, work on exonal transport, Mechanics of stem cells, it's cell adhesion, bacterial phototaxis is an area that we've been working on, a bit of machine learning, but a lot of my work in the last few years has really been about stuff that most of us should have probably been doing as a sideline, which is disease models. And that really happened because of COVID-19. So there's a whole bunch of things that we did at that time, but now I'm coming back to thinking more about biophysical problems, which is really where my, my heart lies. So let me come back to just my last uh, slide here about last cell architecture. Let me just stop now. That's enough time. I hope for questions. <clears throat> thank you, Gautam. Let me uh, clap on behalf of the audience. Uh, thank you so much. That was a really uh, elegant exposition. There are a couple of uh, questions in the chat right now, and hopefully people will uh, put in more um, as, as we go along. And folks, uh, please uh, stay on till after the hour when we have the informal discussion, then you can unmute yourself and, uh, and talk at greater length with Gautam. Uh, so uh, Kabir has a question, uh, which I think you've already answered in the beginning of your talk, but maybe you could just repeat it for people who may have come in late. Uh, how do activities in different domains of chromosome vary? So the idea is that depending upon transcription levels of the genes contained across some basic unit of, of chromosome, which choose the one number unit, that determines the levels of activity. So the way we implement that is to say that if there's lots of genes being written out in this region and lots of genes and very few region, genes being written out in this region, this has a higher effective temperature than this. I use effective temperature in quotes because I said there's a central limit, uh, central limit theorem argument that says I have lots of independent force generators. If I average them over a sufficiently large distance or over some course gaining time, effectively they should behave like something that is delta correlated from time to time, as well as Gaussian distributed, which resembles what I might think of as a temperature. So I think of these regions that are active, these chromosomal regions that are active and being more written out more actively as having a higher temperature. And that's where it enters. That's where activity enters the calculation that, that, that I described up to now. So I had a question. Um, how do I understand this intuitively? Can I think of hot chromosomes as fluctuating more, cold ones as fluctuating less? So entropy just packs them so that the hot ones have more space and the cold ones are near the periphery? So here's, here's somewhat some, an embarrassing point. I have not figured out a really good explanation for this. If you think that the hot ones wanted more entropy, they should be on the outside because much of the volume of the sphere is really on the outside and less on the inside. It's actually inverted. 
I suspect that the answer probably has to do with something called reverse osmosis, active reverse osmosis, which is sort of complicated, but I have not actually done a calculation that shows this. And that's an, mm -hmm. that an intuitive understanding of why this happens, I think is very central and would be very useful. We've shown this in multiple ways. Mm -hmm. We've looked at pure soft matter system that are 50% active, 50% inactive at different sizes. We have large numbers of simulations in 2D and 3D that show exactly this result. But I have no simple explanation for it so far. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So John, John say, has a question. Um, has anyone measured local activity, e.g. by embedding, attaching a tracer particle or using a fluorescent label? Yes, yes, they have. That, that, that's the calculation that Shivashankar, who you know, actually did by putting small colloidal particles into the nucleus and watching their motion. So you can see regions that are, you can also look at tagged particular loci, chromosomal loci. And that's, again, nice work by, I think, Sprakowitz and, and collaborator who analyzed that data from, from about, I guess, 10 years ago. But you do see that different regions of the chromosome tend to have different fluctuation behavior and therefore can be thought of as having different effective temperatures. And the diffusion of small colloidal particles is different depending upon where you are. So there is certainly evidence, strong evidence of the fact that the nucleus is active and is also inhomogeneously active. So Xiangye Ding has a question. Uh, is the chromatin around the nucleolus more active or inactive? How do you think of NADs, nucleolar associated domains, as inactive region, but nucleolus itself is actively having our DNA transcription going on as an active region? So, so we try not to be very, very specific at the microscopic level about we know that these are regions of active transcription because there's a lot of, of, of ribosomal DNA being made at those particular points. There's a lot of, of transcription that happens. Exactly because we ignore those processes, we can just say that if they're active, we can assign them an active temperature based on the transcription levels in those particular regions. Exact, we can't answer at this level any more detailed questions about what specific nuclear organizing regions are actually doing. All we can say is we believe from transcription level that these regions should be active, and we're going to put that into the calculation and see what happens. Uh, so Vidyesh is asking, what happens when a cold chromosome and a hot chromosome come in contact? Do they maintain their temperature? That they do, because they're being independently driven. Mm -hmm. So remember that the equation is, has a TI, that is a, that is a chromosome index. So it, is, it has, you know, it, the noise is correlated. There's a temperature that depends upon the index of the chromosome out there. So they will be driven independently. So because it's also very overdamped, the description. So it doesn't communicate. I mean, the, while there will be some activity here that communicates something nearby, it doesn't communicate over a long time. And it reaches a steady state, a convincing steady state, in which all properties are independent of them fairly fast. Folks, there are no more questions in the chat. So maybe I can turn the recording off a few minutes early and let's proceed to uh, unmute ourselves. Well, here's one. Uh, so Ashwin asks, experimentally it is seen that MSD of nucleosomes near active genes is lower than those with inactive genes. This with a reference, uh, Nozaki et al. This happens because RNA pole attaches itself with certain liquid droplets, lowering the overall MSD of nearby nucleosomes. So one might not be able to conclude that activity implies higher temperature. Well, activity, that, that's possible. And again, much of the experimental data on this is evolving and that's a somewhat, that's a much more microscopic local re droplet region associated with the locally transcribed part where you have multiple stuff coming together. I'm, I'm not in a position to answer that question. I think that's a somewhat more local question than the region that I'm looking at, which is 1MD. And I suspect that some of this will still survive to that larger scale, even if it may not be true for an individual gene loci that you're studying. But I don't know that. That's certainly a good question, certainly something we should think about. Uh, Andre Zakharov uh, is asking, how is the presence of histones included in the model? Um, because first of all, chromatin remodeling involves removing histones, putting them back, etc. So, in a sense, the fact that there is that there is a lot of structuring that is continuously going on that's actively driven involves the histone. But, but the histone itself is something that's too small at a scale for us to model directly. So we don't do that. 